All right, welcome back, everyone. Okay, any questions, any thoughts? So we'll get into chapter, the next chapter, the way of the cross. Any questions, any thoughts? Okay, let's get into the way of the cross. Now, how does the cross, uh, we did this in uh, uh, lifestyle evangelism, so we'll just go quickly and we'll see how much we can finish. Uh, how does the cross affect our lives, our everyday lives? Right? How does it affect us? Galatians 5.11, and I, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross is seized. Galatians 6.12, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So the cross is a place of offense. Right? When I say offense, what does it mean? It's a place where not everyone are going to you know, accept you. There's acceptance, there's offense. Right? If I say something, uh, you may either accept it or take it as an offense. Right? For example, you know, somebody comes and says, Hey, why are you, you know, why are you not reading your word every day? Example, you can take it as an offense or you can take it as an acceptance. Something that you accept, yes, is something that I must do. But when you and I share the message of the cross, it is an offense to people. Why? It's, it's not a good... Paul is saying here, if I still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? If I say, you know, go to the temple, do your sacrifice, or be circumcised, follow the Ten Commandments, Everyone will be happy. That's what I was doing before. But the moment I started preaching about the cross, it was an offense. People, no, will not accept this. We will not accept this as the Messiah. The Jews, the Jews themselves started, you know, persecuting Paul. So there will be offense. But as believers, you and I, when we know the cross, when we know the price that was paid, we will gladly move on. We will gladly do what he wants us to do. Is it an offense? Yes. You know, yesterday I was sharing uh, with the second years. Uh, when I was working in the corporate sector, right, uh, I just became a believer. So I wanted to you know, uh, share the gospel with people. And I began to do that, right? And you know, start small prayer fellowship and all of those things. But people would ridicule and mock very badly they would mock they would you know every time they would see me they would just just go away or all of those things were there and after you know after about two years when i was leaving the company i was willing i was getting ready to join bible college uh, it was my uh, you know they have a farewell right uh, so the team said we'll have a farewell for paul i was surprised that they wanted a farewell for me because they didn't really like me of the things that I would, you know, I would always, I wouldn't drink, I wouldn't smoke, I would they'd go for the parties, I would just be standing there, or sometimes I won't even go for those parties. Um, you know, every time they would, uh, if they, if, if people are gossiping, I would just walk away. Uh, if people are back, by, back biting the managers and all, I would just say, hey, I don't want to talk about it. So I was not cool, right? I was not a cool guy for them. It didn't matter. But now uh, I remember this. For my for the farewell, I was surprised. Right? Oh, farewell! So when I went, uh, 170 odd people came for the farewell. I said, "What?" And then they told me this. My manager, my team leader, and the manager came up to me and said, "Paul, when assistant managers, when people of higher positions, when they are leaving the company, they've been here for 10 years, 12 years. When they're leaving the company, 20 people come and stand." Till now, nobody has had a farewell with so many people. What did you do? You have done something in this company in two years. I said I've done nothing because all I've done was when when people, you know, nothing. I've not done anything. What I shouldn't do, I didn't do. That's it. Right? Like I, I was not like a fanatic always preaching the gospel to everyone inside the office. No. I mind my own business at times, do my work. 
but people noticed they didn't make fun of me the people who made fun of me were there i was really humble because the bible says for those who are ridiculed he will lift up those who are humbled he will lift up right and it was such an honor right to have and we had all senior managers my whole entire team it was a saturday it was a week weekend on a weekend who will come to office they came i was so touched and i thought to myself you see when when people are ridiculing when people mock you god will place honor in your life and even now a few of them from the company few of them i'm in touch with but uh, but it is such a joy right so the offense will be there but god knows how to lift us right <clears throat> so remember when you are sharing the gospel sharing the message of the cross it's an offense but uh, god will work through us separation from the world galatians 6:14 but god forbid that i should boast except in the cross of our lord jesus christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and i to the world right so what is paul saying the cross of christ is also used in scripture for the life which is the result of faith in christ paul is saying here god forbid that i boast in anything except the cross of jesus christ they so saying i don't want to boast in anything that i have do i have wisdom do i have, do i know the old covenant in and out yes but god forbid that i boast all of that that the cross of jesus christ has made no effect and he goes on by whom the world has been crucified crucified to me and i to the world that means the world is dead to me you show anything you 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 bring all the kinds of money all the kinds of any kind of luxuries of this world apostle paul is saying it's dead to me because i'm crucified with christ it's no longer i live it is christ living in me and he goes on to say whom the world has been crucified to me nothing in this world attracts me <clears throat> so paul is saying nothing in this world attracts me now this is a very difficult place to be in right nothing in this world attracts me but only one thing probably attracts me that is to bring people to the lord jesus to build the work of the ministry right and he says and he says this that when we are crucified there is a separation from the world we are separated the worldly things will want these 10 things we will want these 10 things so for example you take somebody from another faith right or he a person who's living a worldly life give them a paper and you take a believer you give them a paper and you you make them write down five things you want from this world right so both of them write it down it will be almost the opposite it better be the almost the opposite uh, this one will say i want the biggest i want a million dollars this one will say i want a church with thousand people it's it, the thinking itself is different why is one is thinking of the world one is thinking of the spirit one is thinking of the natural one is thinking of that of the spiritual the cross you know, in through the cross we fellowship of his sufferings colossians 1 24 through 26 I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God the mystery which was hidden from ages uh, from ages and from generations but now has been revealed to the, his saints verse 24 is wonderful right i now rejoiced in my sufferings for you i rejoice in my sufferings and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of christ which is his body right 
So you and I fellowship in his sufferings. When we look at the persecuted churches all across our nation, what are they doing? They are rejoicing in sufferings. Rejoicing in sufferings. The, you know that uh, remember I mentioned to you about how the church is growing in North India. So this is one video, uh, and uh, somebody shared it to me. I don't remember who, but in the video, we will we will wipe out Christianity. We will destroy it, right? In Hindi, you know, he's saying we will destroy Christianity. And the guy, the the believer. It, in the and this is like the local i think it was punjab so the local news there so maybe everyone i'm watching he's he's laughing in the interview he's, he's laughing and he's saying past 2000 years they're trying to do that it's not going to happen the more the, more the church will grow before he's giving full statistics and all like in the video before there was probably not even one percent of Christians now in in this place in the state of Punjab. Now we are thirty five percent. So how can you say that you will wipe it out? Many people will try. The church is only going to grow. Miracles will happen. You like it or not, it's going to grow. What you'll do? You'll put me to prison. That's okay. And he's you know, he's debating with that interview. And the interviewer is getting angry. He's saying we'll call the police now. He's saying call call. I'm here only. We're all here, right? Uh, you see, you'll go to jail. Then uh, uh, put put me into jail. If you put me to jail, doesn't mean the church will stop. And he's on fire. <laughs> and it's so wonderful to see those interviews. He, uh, that person, I don't know what happened to the interviewer, but the video just stopped. I think they just stopped the video because it was too much for them to handle. Right? We fellowship in his sufferings. Hey, you put me into jail. You do whatever you want. I'm crucified with the world. The church is going to grow. It's not going to stop. It is a fact. It is because this guy, he took out statistics. Uh, fully prepared he was for the interview. Fully prepared. This is, the thing. this is what has happened. India as a nation will never become zero Christianity. It will never happen. Whatever you do, it will never happen. And you take statistics from 2008 when the church was persecuted. You picked Orissa. In the interview, he's saying uh, in Orissa, 2006 was the uh, persecutions. By 2010, the church was double. Who, who, who did it? You tried to kill a few Christians. You killed, you burned churches. You did all that. 2010, we are double. We've grown so much. So the more you persecute, the more the church is going to grow. Uh, that is so powerful. That's so true. as well, Right? But in all of that, the persecution, uh, those are difficult times, yes, but we rejoice and fellowship in our sufferings because we know that these sufferings is going to bring an outcome. Right? I only picture, you know, these people who, uh, you know, in the Kandamal persecution in Orissa, people who lost their lives, Christians who, pastors who were killed, and you know, it was open. You read the certain books, right? Everything was in the open. They would just go kill people, kill Christians, just like that. A life gone. But I'm sure the blood of these people have called out. And God has done a wonderful work in Orissa. Right? So we fellowship in our sufferings. And imagine they are looking down and saying, we died for this cause. Now the church is growing. So it was not in vain. That was not in vain. Was it painful? Very painful. But it's not in vain. God is working. Right? <laughs> Finally, uh, the enemies of the cross of Christ. Philippians 3.17 through 19 brethren join in the following in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern for many walk of whom i have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of christ whose end is destruction whose god is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things. They are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. There are people who just hate the message of the cross. They hate the gospel. 
it's not just okay let them do what they want no they want to come against it they hate it who hates the gospel the most who who do you think hates the gospel the most hates this whole cross you talk about the cross he hates it who jews okay that's second i would feel who's the first person hates it satan obviously who was defeated on the cross satan satan so the moment we talk about the cross he hates it and then he'll put that spirit into people spirit of hate and deception no don't believe this he just hates it the moment you and i look at the devil and say hey the cross has done what he has to do for me he hates that feeling he'll do all he can to make you an enemy to the cross you say are you sure jesus died on the like you know the blood was shed on the cross and all of that are your sins forgiven i feel you're still guilty i feel you're still not changed you're still the same 10 years you're in ministry you're still the same but even after 10 years you say no but jesus has done the work no he hates that feeling well, why do you think apostle paul uh, at one point i feel the devil would have said okay leave him let's go to somebody else there's no way to get this guy there are enemies of the cross in the world people who oppose the message of the cross and do it for many reasons some don't understand the gospel some don't like the gospel some are fanatics and whatever the reason may be some are enemies of the cross in the church right uh, and paul writes about it you know there are people in the church who whose god is their belly which means they involve in self indulgence shameful pride whose glory is in their shame, worldliness, who thinks of the things of the world. And uh, Paul is saying their end is destruction. If you read the epistle of 1 Corinthians, which you will learn in the final year, in 1 Corinthians, Paul is rebuking the church. The entire letter, he's almost the entire letter, he's just telling them, what are you all doing? Right? You all are believers. You all are flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. You have, you have uh, prophecy, word of knowledge, all the gifts you have. But there's separation. I will follow Paul. I will follow Apollos. Then one is saying, uh, you know, they're taking part in the Lord's table however they feel like. Uh, there is sexual immorality. right? So people are involving in sexual immorality, coming back to the church and sitting. Paul is saying, hey, you're indulging yourself. Your, your belly is your, your God is your belly. That means whatever you feel like you're doing, but you're coming on Sunday and sitting. Right? Uh, and you glory in all the things that you do. Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians, he says, even the people in the world don't glory in it. Right? If they are involving in sexual immorality, they involve in it, go home and keep quiet about it. But we are glorying in that. We're talking about it openly. Paul was really upset, right? So even within the church, the things that we do can cause us to become an enemy of the cross. So we need to be very careful, right? And in the end, he says here, the end is destruction. Their end is destruction. Yet if they turn back to Christ, God is willing to forgive them and change the end. Finally, by us continuing to sing sin, we're crucing, crucifying the Son of God afresh. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the son of god and put them to an open shame he starts off this verse by saying for it is impossible for us who have tasted the heavenly gift 
who've tasted Jesus, tasted his presence, and go back to the things of this world. Unfortunately, it's happening. When you read globally what is happening, there are pastors, there are people who are believers for many years, um, and somehow they've gone away from the faith. Right? And it's very sad to see that, you know, over the time, I've, uh, you know, many of them have sent me some videos of the preachings that are happening around the globe. Some of those teachings are so painful to hear. Right? Uh, one of the teaching was somebody, some message, right? Some video was sent where he says, uh, you know, uh, Jesus didn't want to be with Mary Magdalene. Or then there was some other kinds of teachings and ridiculous teachings. This is all the works of the enemy, right? Trying to penetrate, trying to bring deceiving spirits, trying to, you know, uh, default the word of God, right? Just to, you know, remove that effect of God's word from people's lives, right? And there are um, some of the you know, some of them who believe in the. Um, LGBT and the gay community, they're okay with it. And we're okay with it, but but what does the Bible say? That is secondary. So God is love, so you need to love them. Yeah, that's true. But God is love, but he hates the sin. You open the Old Testament, he'll, you will read all kinds of words. I, 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 I abhor. That means I don't even want to look at you. I abhor the sin that you are doing. So they've taken text and not put it into context. That's why you are studying hermeneutics this year. Right? Always understand those scriptures and use it in the right way. So we've come to the end of this section. What we'll do is we'll start section three next week. Uh, we'll stop for now. Uh, any questions by those who are online? Any questions here? Okay, yes, Nina, go ahead. Go ahead, Nina. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, Nina, we can't hear you. Uh, can you be a little so louder, please? Where... Can you hear me now? No, it's. Uh, you want to oh. increase the volume or something? Yeah. Uh, just hold on, Nina. Just a minute, please. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, your voice is very low, so. Uh, okay. I'll try now. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, about this scripture that we just looked at, Hebrews six, four to six. So it's talking about that it is impossible for those who are once enlightened. And who have who have tasted uh, the law? I mean, the Holy Spirit and the gift and everything. Yeah. And uh, if they fall away, so when we when we say fall away, because it also says that it's impossible for them to renew them again to repentance. So um, what exactly? I mean, is it not possible at all for them to come back? Or if they repent, they can come back. How how do we understand that passage? Yes. Yeah, you know. So one thing we know is no matter how much we sin, the Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive our sin. So we must understand that there may be a believer and suddenly they've, for some reasons, they've gone away from the Lord, right? And they may have spent all their life in sin and immorality and uh, just being this uh, person who doesn't believe in God. But towards the end of his life, if he says, no, I think I've done something wrong, I, and if he goes back to the cross, there is always forgiveness. God will never reject uh, because he's going back in forgiveness. Right? And God will forgive every sin. Uh, that is always there. Uh, but so in line with the scripture, what, what we're trying to get at is if we have tasted the Lord, uh, for us to go back, and sin is basically like saying it's like rejecting the Son of God, uh, and and if they don't come back, if they don't renew their relationship with God, uh, they're going to fall away, and their destruction 
their end is destruction but if they come back to christ anybody anyone right they may be the worst criminals or murderers but if they come back to the cross they find forgiveness so that's always there yeah right anything else okay all right let's just uh, pray and close we'll meet uh, next week uh, to start from section three let's pray father we thank you for enabling us throughout the entire course lord uh, thank you for your holy spirit that teaches us lord we have studied on covenants and the cross and our hearts are so grateful for this divine exchange that you have orchestrated for each of our lives pray god that you will teach us you will lead us you will empower each one of us to walk this life that you have given us lord with the authority the power of your holy spirit lord we commit each one of us into your hands lord we pray god that your holy spirit will empower us to fulfill everything that you have called us to do we give you all the praise and glory in jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you so much everyone have a great week i'll see you next week